How in the world? Oh my goodness. Did that just happen? It's a game built for TV. This is caught. Diggs, and the way it's evolved over the years, more cameras, more access, more coverage, allows our fans to really connect with our game in a way unlike any other. For several decades now, the NFL is the most watched programming in the United States. Oh, look at this run! What a run! Marshawn Lynch! It only makes sense that our network partners would use us and that big stage as a breeding ground and experimental area for technical innovation. 12 and take 12. The most impactful innovations are the ones that if you're watching the game today, you can just say, I can't believe we didn't have this at one point. Something as, as rudimentary as the clock and score on the screen at all times. It's a game changing thing. But our job in television is capturing not only the X's and O's, but the drama and the pageantry of the game is only one part of it. In that, 40 years since I saw my first NFL broadcast. There have been so many different tools that have been brought to the table to make those types of telecasts more enjoyable. This is NFL Explained, broadcast innovations. A 53-yard field goal from Robbie Gold is gold. SpongeBob. To really understand all that's been accomplished in order to transport you from the living room to the playing field, we need to go back to the beginning. October 22nd, 1939, the Brooklyn Dodgers hosted the Philadelphia Eagles at Ebbets Field and the NFL on television was born. Local NBC affiliate W2XBS broadcast the first ever telecast of a professional football game to local New Yorkers lucky enough to own a television set. These small regional broadcasts were the norm until 1951. Vision is the Dumont dimension. Television manufacturer Dumont beamed out the first National Football League game to air coast to coast. Yes, thanks to television, that marvel of modern science, even our unfortunate friends and millions of other people can sit back in the comfort of their own homes and enjoy every thrill of the game with no struggle for tickets. Watching football on television largely remained unchanged until, in 1963, the literal building block of the modern NFL broadcast was unleashed onto audiences. The first in-game replay. Uh, well, as a very small kid, I remember seeing an instant replay and thinking it was a time machine. I mean, it was magic. Because up until then, it was just live. You couldn't watch the play again. And then all of a sudden now, with replay, that changed everything. What a fundamental, clear thing that we take for granted, right? Touchdown is scored, and we know we're going to get five looks at it. That technology, just to be recording the game as you're broadcasting it, and then stopping a tape recorder, quite literally, and rewinding it and playing it back, was revolutionary. Slow motion replays, and the way that cameras using super telephoto lens were able to get under the helmet into the eyes to not only see what happened during a play, but also to see how people felt about it, what the effect was on emotion for the game. Some of the innovations resonate with the actual storytellers, the producers and directors of those tools that demonstrate the emotional effect on the players and the coaches and even the fans. Coach, we're going to have a play right now. You can see it on this monitor. I hope I can see This it. is slow motion now as Jerry Kramer makes a key block for Bart Starr on this quarterback sneak for the winning yes. touchdown. You will see Jerry Kramer blow them out of there. Yeah, that's a fine block and it's a real good. There are so many things happening simultaneously on the field that it's almost impossible to take that all in in one go. It's one of those perfect sports where after every play, you've got the opportunity to tell the story of what happened. Critical to what we do. And then it just, it's everything about the understanding of the game and the evolution of analysis, Chris Collinsworth and Tony Romo. All the work that they do is because you have the ability to show replays from different angles. This is an outstanding throw. I mean, he sees the leverage of everybody. You're going to see this go out here 
and it's going to be high though, right? So he's supposed to throw it to the sideline, but because the defender's low and the ball's going to go out of bounds, he turns Andrews around. He throws him back inside perfectly. That is the game's biggest play, 31 yards and a score. The Oilers six yards away from a tie. It is Renfro, touchdown, or is it? Of course, the officials did not have the luxury that we enjoy of seeing that instant replay. And now the Oilers are denied a touchdown. Oh, my. It was primarily to provide viewers with the best look of what you could see. And it just kept getting slower and slower as the technology capability got better and better. And I think the layered on side effect when instant replay was implemented was we could take advantage of these slow motion angles and we could use them to make better decisions in our replay process. Gentlemen, no, uh, no discussion really about uh, the NFL in the 80s is complete without touching on the decade's most controversial innovation, instant replay. In March of 1986, the NFL adopted a one year system of limited instant replay of officiating calls. The replay official will watch replay or replays on one or both monitors and complete his review within a reasonable period of time, probably 15 to 20 seconds. Right now, the instant replay system runs off of the program feed, which is what you see at home. So those replays, as they come up for you at home, that's when they're coming up for the officiating department in the instant replay booth that can allows them to make the right decisions. After reviewing the play, the ruling on the field has been changed. It is a touchdown. Thanksgiving Day 1965 marked the first ever NFL broadcast in color. And as television ownership grew, an NFL football started its upward trajectory to the rating dominance it owns today. A new concept was introduced in 1970, football on TV on Mondays. Welcome to ABC's Monday Night Primetime National Football League television series. Monday Night Football doubled the amount of cameras used to cover a game, two of which were mobile handheld units that delivered a fresh new view for the action. No this, along with an emphasis on expanded graphics, shaped the NFL's broadcast format for decades. Camera quality increased, broadcast clarity increased, but for the most part, watching the NFL on TV was a similar experience for the next 24 years, until a simple graphic kicked off the race to deliver what we know today as the modern NFL viewing experience. The most impactful innovations are the ones that if you're watching the game today, It'd be hard to imagine, I can't believe we didn't have this at one point. Something as rudimentary as the clock and score on the screen at all times. Before the mid 90s, you didn't know what the score and the time left in the game at all times was. David Hill was the founder of Fox Sports. He came over from England. I think he brought the sensibilities of soccer to the US. And you know, in soccer, there are obviously no commercial breaks. So the necessity of having the score up there oftentimes is an anchor for sponsorship. But nevertheless, the score is up there constantly. And and they debuted it in 1994 in the fall. You, you always ask, how much time is there to go? Right. You, know, you always got this, you always know how much time there is and what the score is. You can look up there, second, 12 seconds, score, you always know the score. Three. You always know. In the early days of clock and score, there were certain heads of networks who were like, I'm never gonna put a clock and score on the screen. Oh, I don't want someone to turn this on and see the score and maybe it's a blowout, they're just gonna move away from it type thing. It's like, okay, man, at some point, <laughs> you're going to have to because the fans are going to demand it. Do you want it in the upper left, upper right, bottom right, bottom left? Do you want it to be a band across the bottom? And there's a lot of different opinions about how that would work. So the actual footprint of it was more of a design decision and production presentation decision. Getting the interface to work was more the challenge than the actual broadcast side of it. Everybody thinks now in the modern world, everything's at a USB port. You just plug in, you automatically get it. That was not so back in the day. In many cases, we had to cut wires, splice them together, be down at Radio Shack and, and soldering things together to make the interface work to the actual scoreboard. Oh, let's go do clock and score for college football. It's, surely it's got to be easier. And in many cases, like there's no way it's easier. It, these, some of these scoreboards are designed by some local guy in a garage. 
good news is the broadcasters kind of got a collective together and said, look, there's no competitive advantage to having a clock and score on one broadcast and not on the other. So let's get together and collectively go into these stadiums and bring them all up to a standard so that when the next broadcaster comes in, they just plug in and they've got reliable clock and score data. And seeing how each one has a different approach on how they execute it, and then which networks like to lean heavy on our next-gen stats data, the knowing who's on the field at any given point, constant stat updates, and, and your traditional score updates from elsewhere around the league on Sunday afternoon and that's obviously huge. A lot of broadcast graphics really are tied to the power of microchips, getting less expensive and, and more and more powerful. That progression has allowed the expression of creativity on the score bugs. We'll see next steps in the future iterations of different ways fans will have of watching games and maybe being able to customize those views so that they can pick and choose the things that they like and the data that they want to see overlaid. That could be the next evolution of what may feel like the norm 10 years from now as that develops over time. The step of adding the score bug and the use of advancing computer power to place constant on-screen graphics would help pave the way for the single best innovation for watching sports on television. I remember growing up, we had a family friend from Europe who watched football games with me and I'd try to explain to him, you have four downs to get 10 yards. And if you don't understand the game, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But if, I, if you see this yellow line on the screen, you say, the objective right now is just to get past that yellow line. It changes fundamentally how you view it. The technology to, to make it feel seamless, that it looks like it's part of the field, it's not intrusive, that's an incredible achievement. The fact that that was done 25 plus years ago is, is incredibly meaningful. The first augmented reality use in sports was the glowing puck in hockey. And in many ways, it was seen as sort of one of the best bad ideas anybody had ever had. It caused hockey to have some of the best ratings it's ever had, but it created a ton of controversy, and the diehard fans hated it. Because, you know, if you're a macho hockey fan, you don't need this, you know, rocket trail. And so, you know, we even got death threats. Certainly people had their opinions about that. There's still great debate about whether it was something that belongs in hockey or not. I still predict that you will see it again. But the important thing as we talk about football is that it begat one of the most important innovations of all time, which was, of course, the yellow line. One of the many unique aspects of this technology is that the first and ten line appears to be painted on the field. Unlike telestrator lines, which interfere with the action, sitting on top of the play and the players, the first and ten line sits under the action. The players can step on it. The refs can even stand on it. David Crane, he had a patent on this idea of inserting something into video that would be an indication of a uh, status. So one of the subsets of that could be with the yellow first down line. You can't really patent an idea. You have to patent an embodiment of an idea. I can't just say, that, oh, I want, I've got a system I want to patent to go to Jupiter on a Tuesday and come back on a Thursday. The patent itself has to be what's called enabling. You have to be able to hand somebody who's skilled in the art when they take that patent, they should be able to build the system. To implement that back in the day in 78, you would need computers the size of battleships. I mean, there was just no way that was gonna be a practical solution. It took 20 years, 1998, for the yellow line to actually see the light of day. Really, that's a function of the processing power needing to catch up with the idea. I had been calculating and figuring out that it was just barely possible to be able to do a very simple graphic quickly enough so that you could overlay it in live video. If you could do that, could you do something useful? Like, could you superimpose information in the video that the fans cared about that had to do with the sport? We took the yellow line and sort of shopped it to see who wanted to introduce it. Anybody who knows Jed knows that he has the guts to do things like that. He asked me the question, how do I know it's gonna work? It's gonna be adventurous and there's gonna be some problems. So Jed, your decision is, do you want the Emmy or do you want somebody else to get the Emmy? It was not blessed by the NFL. They had not had any input into it at that time. So we were making a big gamble. We're making a gamble on people we didn't know, a project that was only going to be funded by us, one that would require computing power that was like ridiculous. It was nine months in the making and there were a thousand pitfalls along the way. Are we doing the right thing here? Is this really going to work? They made a turn, Giants Stadium, in the preseason and we brought Paul Tagliabu, then commissioner, down to the television truck compound at Giants Stadium. 
If the NFL said no, we're done. And we showed it to him and he paused and he said, yeah, I think this is going to be good. Let's keep going. And we said, thank you very much. And he left. And then fortunately, those doors are rather heavy because I think that the shouting that one might have heard if you were a little closer would have been of a 10 of us with immense size of relief that it had been blessed by the commissioner. And all we had to do was make it work. One month later, we launched it in Baltimore. To help you better enjoy our Sunday night coverage, ESPN unveils its latest technical innovation on tonight's game. It's ESPN's first and 10. The gold colored line you'll see appears to be painted on the field, but it's really being electronically generated by us. It's a visual reference for you to always know the yard line and offense has to reach for a first down. ESPN's first and 10. We think you're going to like it. If you go back and look at the first game, You'll see the line is actually really unsteady on the field. And one of the things that we decided to do in order to mask that a little bit, there's almost a little bit of smoke in it so that the line is less distinct than it was before. It's just sort of there. It's not anywhere near what you would look to on the field today. And a lot of people really would wonder, you know, is that happening at the stadium? Is that chalk and they're vacuuming it up? You know, does anybody see a vacuum guy going back and forth? When you think about the number of computers that were needed, I mean, there was an entire semi truck that was filled with nothing but racks of computers. We did first and 10 four years before the iPod. We were like 10 years before the first iPhone. To think about in terms of technology rollout, I mean, we were way ahead of the curve. It was just uniformly positively received. And that was a great relief to all of us because the puck had been um, quite a weight on our shoulders because it had created such a fury. And even today, you've got to be careful where you mention you were involved in the, in the puck. If you're in New England or in Boston, it's not a good idea to, to, to own up to that. How it became is one thing. How it works is another challenge altogether. The first problem is how do I draw this in the right geometry? You have electronics on the camera and you've got four different parameters. You've got the pan angle, the tilt angle, the zoom and the focus. So there's four different parameters for every frame. The software receives the video frame, receives the four parameters and the software then determines what is that camera actually looking at right now? to figure out the geometry of where we want to draw the yellow line in each frame. Initially, you couldn't do this unless you had the ability to create those electronics yourself. Now, the manufacturer of the camera heads have come up with instrumented camera heads so that it already produces the pan value or the tilt value, and you just need to calibrate your system to receive that. I'd have somebody, one of our engineers, go out to set this thing up, and he, he probably weighs 110 pounds soaking wet, and he set it all up, and everything's great. All the models are running terrific. And then the 300 pound camera guy steps in behind the camera and it shifts everything. So the optical center of where that camera is in space is down two inches and the line's not exactly where it should be and producers going crazy. So you learn these things as you go. The second problem is how do I draw it in a way that it looks like it's painted on the field and doesn't paint on the person in the foreground? And the way that that's done is what's called color filtering. It's a very specific color picking software that we use that says these are the colors, shades, the RGB values, red, green, blue values that we want and only those values that we want our graphics to show up on. I can come all the way in and get the individual RGB values off each pixel. The line over there is pretty solid because of the filtering systems that we use. Obviously, the field goal line, the yellow line, and the blue line are not showing up on the logo because I don't want them showing up on the logo. I always rely on my eyeballs. <laughs> um, the computer is great at what it's doing, but it won't let us know that lighting conditions are changing. I can't control what the clouds are going to do during a noon game, right? We can't control if the camera zooms way in and video iris is up and lets more light in. That changes the RGB value of the field on the screen. So it's all of those things that the operator here has to constantly be sitting and working through. Looks like he's just short of first down yardage. So one of the early days, we're doing Notre Dame, playing USC, ranked number one. It was a big game, big out of game. Notre Dame comes out in their normal blue uniforms for the warm-up, and my guys are on site, and they're like, oh, great, we've color filtered, we've got all the color globes. They go back in the tunnel, and then they come out of the tunnel wearing all green which everybody in the stadium erupts. Everybody in America that likes Notre Dame is going crazy. Oh, this is great, they're wearing green. The only people in the world that are having a heart attack are my people in the truck going, oh my God, they're wearing green, the same color as the grass. Eckler, first down. During a game, we go based on where the chains are 
And if the chains are not visible, we work at the referee's feet. Where the far sideline judge spots with his foot, that's where I place my line. When the ball comes into view and then is placed, if I need to adjust based on where the ball is placed, then we adjust based on where the ball is placed. We can make sure that the lines look any way they want. We can change colors and aspects. So we're sitting in front of the SkyCam camera tracker operating station here. And, and what I do in this position here is run the software that keeps the first down line and the line of scrimmage on air from SkyCam. We're actually visually tracking the picture, the image that's coming in from SkyCam. Okay. We're actually able to do all of this in about 150 milliseconds of delay. And then that system then relays into our smart Telestrator system so that we can go on air with things like the tackle box graphics. There is no set and forget about this. So it's an all game process, constantly moving back and forth between the computers, making sure that everything is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And when you have a great idea and you add a great amount of effort to it, it translates into a lasting legacy. I'm running around in blue jeans and a t-shirt, fixing problems during games. When I remember a, a small kid and his father came in late, and I hear the small kid ask, hey, where's the yellow line? I remember thinking to myself, hey, maybe this is going to work. I think you'd be hard pressed to find something that's been that innovative to the game of football, it made it much more inclusive. It's kind of broadened the reach of the sport. You would have to be just an absolute dyed in the wool contrarian to not look at that and say, there's what it was before. Here's what it is now. This is better. The first down line wasn't the only paradigm shift in 1998, as a clearer picture was beginning to take shape on a clearer picture. I actually feel that the greatest innovation in, in all of broadcasting, and certainly for sports, was the advent of high-definition television. HD TV, the clearest picture you can possibly get. But it did not happen overnight. I have no idea what HD TV is. <laughs> the first high-def I ever saw was in the LA Coliseum for the Olympics. I went, whoa, let's fast forward. I come to CBS in 1998 and I'm looking to make my mark. The president of Sony Broadcast was a good friend of mine. And I went to him and I said, look, let's try to do some NFL games in high def. We did like four games. They were side by side broadcast with the four by three NTSC broadcast that we are normally doing. We can only transmit to a few transmitters, but we had to start someplace. There were a lot of people that were now starting to look at this and go, hey, wait a minute. Not only the signal of high def, but it's the aspect ratio of 16 by 9 versus 4 by 3 that really made a big difference. And now the other networks are now calling me and saying, how are you guys doing that? By 2006, we were all kind of doing high def. Nobody wanted to see anything else. We're increasing the size of the picture. We're increasing the number of scan lines. It was a huge, huge leap forward. Collins, line drive. The big question is always cost. It's like, oh, wait a minute. We're, we're going to move to that next level. That's going to cost us more money. Yes, it is. You know, uh, but eventually you're going to find ways to be able to make that pay off. It's the size of the signal and the amount of data that has to get pushed and processed through every pipe and every facet of the production, including replay, of course, where now you're recording so much more material and now you have to have machines that are capable of doing that. Some of your biggest advertisers were the television manufacturers because they're out there now selling these high def monitors. You can see it on channel 56 if you shelled out approximately 7,500 bucks for a new HD TV. For a long time, we had to service both the 4x3 audience as well as the high def because not every affiliate was even capable of transmitting a high def signal. So we had to do what we called four by three safe. We had to put the graphics four by three safe. We had to actually have the producers and the directors shoot the game four by three safe, not really filling the screen for the high def viewer. And that, that went on for several years. The added resolution and the evolution of camera technology begin to give way to creative uses in ways previously unavailable. iVision was really interesting. This was 2001, we were in Tampa doing the Super Bowl that year. My boss came to me and said, hey, listen, let's 
come up with something that we can do for the Super Bowl. What about the movie The Matrix? You know, that's kind of really cool where, you know, you can go around the scene. Why don't we try to do that? We had to piece together a lot of technology. We were looking to put cameras all around the rim of the stadium. The idea was you'd have each of the cameras going down to a server. When you're replaying it to get that effect, you go to the server, freeze the shot, and then go around where those cameras were at the moment. The cameras had to be perfectly timed. We ended up going to Japan, to Mitsubishi, who built all these robotics that would control the cameras. Then we needed to calibrate all the cameras. So we ended up going to Carnegie Mellon, where the school had worked on a lot of robotics and calibrating and had this calibrating system. To me, it was even like some voodoo that the Car Carnegie Mellon uh, engineers would walk out in the field with a stick and all the cameras would focus to it and it was a light and they would do this and this in their software and every day <laughs> of that year going towards that Super Bowl was filled with oh I don't think we're gonna be able to do this no oh, this is wait this is not gonna work that's not gonna work. I'm not gonna stop I'm gonna keep trying sure enough eventually we put all this together did a lot of testing and um, it worked and we were able to capture just a, a great moment in, in the corner of the end zone one of the running backs had scored we were able to actually freeze it and go around we got there and we did it and it was really pretty exciting and there's oh, your best angle right there yep that's him in 2003, watching NFL football on television took on a whole new angle, literally. I don't know of any camera on any sport where the coverage has been fundamentally changed to the extent that it has been by Skycam. It's that profound. Traditionally, you watch the game east to west, but it's a north to south game. And all of a sudden, I can watch the game from behind the line of scrimmage with the quarterback or the running back's perspectives. It's such a great view where Analysts can break down the X's and O's of what the game is about and can really get into some crazy detail that really shows, A, how much of an expert these analysts are. They're going to roll the coverage over the top. And on the other side, Mike Evans is going to be one-on-one -on -one against Jalen Ramsey. Brady saw that defense roll that way, and he said, I'm coming right back to my guy. And B, how hard the coaching staff's work and how hard the players work in order to execute these things with such intricacy and detail in order to be successful on the field. That look lets you see what that's all about. An inventor, mad inventor, by the name of Garrett Brown, who had invented the Steadicam, came up with the idea of a Skycam. Now, this was in the early 80s. I had just been named a vice president at NBC. I was looking for some innovations, and I get a call from Garrett Brown, and he said, can I come in and talk to you about Skycam? And when he came in, he thought I didn't know who he was. I knew exactly who he was. This is the guy who did the Steadicam, that great shot of Sylvester Stallone going up the staircase. The shot in Return of the Jedi is you're going through the trees, and all of that was filmed on Garrett's Steadicam, and I was well aware of that. And he, he said to me, do you think we could try this on a game? And I said, yes. NBC, who was doing the Orange Bowl, which was January of 84, I convinced them, let's, let's go put the Skycam in. We talked to the Orange Bowl people and the teams, and everyone was, oh, the, the kickers are going to kick into it. We had to leave it so high, and we couldn't really move it very far. It was probably nothing more than a helicopter shot, but that was it. We did it. Time goes on now, we're trying to introduce Skycam to the NFL. So we went to the Coliseum to do a test and NBC was there, CBS was there, ABC was there, you know, all the directors and the producers and the Skycam guys came and lo and behold, during the test, the pilot made a mistake, brought the camera over by the goalpost, boom, hits the goalpost, the goalpost goes down, that's it. We're not going to do it. This isn't going to be safe. This is going to be a big problem. When it happened, we all kind of went, here we had this one opportunity. And we, we, 
It got blown. Wow. And it delayed the debut of Skycam, really for 10 years in the NFL. Along comes the XFL. This was a crazy football league, as everybody knows. And they go, hey, let's, you know, kids are now looking at video games and let's put it right behind the offense and let's really make it work. The XFL didn't last, but the Skycam technology was, whoa, got a lot of attention. So suddenly, Skycam was back in the conversation. Of course, now in subsequent years, we started practicing in preseason games, proved that a punter wasn't going to kick it. We came up with plans that devised so the pilot couldn't go too low, couldn't go too far out of the way. We were able to bring the sky cam down lower so we're right behind the quarterback and you could get that view that was just awesome. Prescott watches tight end. Schultz, touchdown Dallas. I think that it's fair to say that the absolute basics of the way Garrett Brown designed the Skycam exists today. The bottom line is you have four cables going back to the corner, going down to reels that are letting cable out, pulling cable in. That's basically how it moves. This is one of the four reels that's uh, in the stadium. We put one in each corner and then we run the line up through a high point of the stadium through a pulley above us. The pulley points are typically between 120 and 200 feet. We're getting the cable off of the drum, up through the pulley, and I'm and then down to the field via this string. Um, so I'm just gonna heave ho it. I've been watching my Dak Prescott warm up like stuff. Pretty, uh, pretty young. No, we're just like that. And then it goes down and terminates at the camera. Each drum has about 1,100 feet of cable on it. Typically, in a, in a normal NFL fly space, we'll have about 500 feet of cable out on each winch. The camera's about 60 pounds. The cables are stress tested to 800 pounds per cable. So if we're going 20 miles an hour and we encounter max G force, the cable is more than rated for the 60 pounds plus G force. It's kind of a cool cable, actually. At the core, it's a piece of glass, fiber optic glass. So all of our data, all of our video can travel down each one of the four cables. So we actually power the camera through copper that's inside the cable. And then there's a Kevlar strength member uh, to keep us, keep us in the air. Each stadium we come into, we, we pull a survey, we call it. And it's essentially um, taking the cables from the support cable and, and pulling them down to the field to a, um, to a right triangle. And using Pythagorean's theorem, we can then calculate exactly where those pulleys are in three-dimensional space. This is a diagram of our fly space. Um, this would be the football field. We're just defining planes in space to keep the camera inside a box, essentially, so that we don't hit support cables on the jumbotron here or in the seats or anything like that. Welcome back to SoFi Stadium in Thursday Night Football. And we're going. Here we go. I'm gonna put a little more speed on it and start tilting me down. Coming down, here we go. 14-13, Chargers on top. There's one pilot and there's one operator. So I'm positioning the camera in three-dimensional space, X, Y, and Z, and then um, my usual operator is doing pan, tilt, zoom, focus next to me. We'll get a pull off these guys. Yep. And pull them back, here we go. So the computer is interpreting my joystick inputs and coordinating the four reels together to reel in or out to position the camera in. We can go about 20 miles an hour, and the fastest guys on the field are usually going about 22 or 23. So you can almost keep up. This fog really is getting thicker, Al. It's much closer to the field. It just keeps sinking and settling down here on the field. A few years ago, when NBC had a game in New England, and it was so foggy, you couldn't really follow with your traditional cameras. They were too far away, and if you zoom in, you're working through so much fog that you can't really get a good picture. The only camera that could get reasonably well positioned was the Skycam. We have to go to an audible here because the fog is so thick. So most of what you'll see will be from low. Sort of by accident, they had to switch to that camera for live play coverage. And it was something that maybe had occasionally happened before, but it was the first time you'd see full drives covered from that angle. And I think with a certain set of NFL fans, 
they knew that angle and they knew it from playing Madden. That's my game, what's yours? Like they're playing Madden or something. They're just out there, ding, 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 ding. The coaches and the, the players, they hardly even know it's there. You know, when it was first there, it was like a big deal. Punters during pregame warmups would do everything they could to try to punt right into the camera itself. We saw the addition of what they're calling the high sky, where you've got a second sky cam higher up that can be a little bit more directly on top of the line of scrimmage to give even more of an X's and O's look. It really all comes together and you could see all the moving parts meshing and reacting and leading to a successful play. So they crash everybody inside and Reader is gonna come flying through with a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to tackle Fournette. He misses that tackle. And look what we have now. So the view is great, but as talented storytellers often say, sound is half of the picture. Since Fox Sports' inception, audio has been at the forefront of our thinking. That had a lot to do with John Madden. I think John Madden felt that audio was a huge part of the game, probably from his many years being on the sidelines and hearing the crunches and the sound. So he was a big proponent of that. So for another Bronco first down. I'll tell you, there is some contact down there. Did you notice that sound that you hear? And this game's in stereo. Being down there sideline, you can hear boom, whack, whack, whack. But I don't know what it feels like in stereo. I mean, I, boom, 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 boom. It's pretty much the same, I think. Everybody wants to get access into the field. They would rather cover the field from the inside out than the outside in. And what I mean by that is that you're only gonna be able to get so much with your parabolic microphones and your microphones on the handheld cameras. At some point, you run into physical limitations of what collection devices can even do. And then, if you actually came up with something that could get literally everything on the field, then I think the NFL would be the first ones to tell you that you probably shouldn't use it or it would be governed very strictly by other entities, understandably. Someone's not happy with the alignment. Oh, boy. And he changed and slides down at the 16. One of the great innovations that probably came out of the 80s was on-field audio, the umpire used to stand behind the linebackers. And so somebody had a great idea. Can we put a microphone on the umpire? And all of a sudden, the quarterback is shouting in the direction of the umpire. You hear his voice. You hear the line of scrimmage at the snap of the ball and the bodies, and you got incredible audio. 2009, for safety reasons, they moved the umpire into the offensive backfield, who now stands you know, parallel to the referee behind the offense. And all of a sudden you lost that access to that audio. Talk to the networks, how do we replace this? Think big, think pie in the sky. Well, what if we could put mics on players? Can you mic up the quarterback? Hey, quit quit talking to my helmet, whoever that is, quit. Well, that, that might be challenging. Can we mic up the offensive lineman and have a live open mic and get that audio back? And you know, we said that's kind of a crazy thought. Like who puts live microphones into a game that are on players? But we said, right, let's let's explore that. And so as part of the collective bargaining that came out in 2011, one of the things that, that we were able to negotiate with the Players Union was the right to put microphones on offensive linemen. 10 years ago, it was almost a, a, a brick wall of, sorry, we're just not comfortable, that's too much information, or that's getting too close, or uh, too much of an inside look for the fans. Primarily saying, if you show that to the fans, our opponents will also be watching, and future opponents who could potentially gain an advantage from this type of access. All right, hey, what's that mic? <laughs> and so we've worked to get the football side of the league comfortable with it's safe, it's being done appropriately. The proper judgment is being used as far as what goes on the air and what does not. And it's not going to give away your game plan. We really had to first start with what's the technology we're gonna use, right? It's gotta be reliable. It's gotta be cost efficient. We have to be able to deploy it at every game, right? For all the legacy of NFL films and miking players and coaches, it's one thing to pick a few games a week and go out and do it. It's another to do 256, now 272 games a year. 
15th play of the drive. Newton finds him. McCaffrey, touchdown. Live microphones in minus 20 degrees on 250-pound men crashing into each other. That's hard. The National Football League has a very, very strict protocol about what touches players nothing goes inside everything goes outside so there's nothing that's protruding from the shoulder pads there's nothing that you'd slide inside the shoulder pads there's a microphone on the front and there's a microphone on the back it's a stereo mic and then the transmitter which is rubberized and flexible also on the outside of the pads covered with little waterproof material and away we go the physical mic is six millimeter very very tiny the transmitter itself is is five inches long rubber about an inch and a half thick. So those are remote controlled. They're encrypted, so no one's going to steal the signal. 319! 319! The commissioner has laid out a very specific timing aspect about when those microphones can be open, when they can be closed. There's a human being that literally opens and closes that physical feed. Snap of the huddle, slow fade up, scream, 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 line call, scream, snap. Three, two, one out every stadium every week 10 years it's the same are you not entertained along the way the no huddle thing became very uh popular that gets tricky uh, what if a team doesn't huddle well you need an enhanced audio person with some experience because you can't just leave that microphone up the whole time 10 years later this is just a routine part of what we do and you know i still think about it all the time that i think it's still unique in any sport and any broadcast live audio coming off of a mic from on a player in every single game we play. You think about kind of Peyton Manning, Omaha. Omaha! 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 That was this. That access is what makes our game so different. Hey, Scooby-Doo! Scooby-Doo! Scooby-Doo, where are you? I'm here to make this fun. Centers, screaming line calls, shift left, shift left. While Tom Brady is back there screaming, 54 is the mic. I still dig that after 25 years. I like that stuff. 53! No, I'm not the hey, mic! Brooklyn! I'm not the mic! Brooklyn! I'm going! Oddly enough, those microphones rarely get destroyed in the game. They get destroyed upon removal. If a team is mad, if a team gets angry after a loss, Wires get torn way more than microphones get destroyed. NFL broadcasts can employ over 180 total microphones, all to bring you this. This is weird. It's all good. Dead silence. No, it's just dead silence. The other thing about audio is listening to the crowd. Because one thing that the pandemic showed us was that listening to a game with an empty stadium it just doesn't have remotely the same excitement as a crowd full of people. In fact, ourselves and the NFL ended up pumping in crowd noise for that reason, and it helped a lot. But from that experience, we started wondering if we were paying enough attention to the crowd. One of the current thoughts is trying to make that crowd sound more dynamic. They have crowd effects microphones around the stadium. The immersive experience of actually sitting amongst the fans, they get that and they do a tremendous job. So this one has 72 channels on the bottom layer. It has 72 channels on the top layer. And then it has 12 layers deep. You can call through all the different layers to open up and uh, do different things. So we, we have a lot of capability on this console. We have six parabolic microphones, which are the dishes that you'll see on the sidelines. And that's what hits up, picks up all the crunches and hits and impact and whistles. It can pick sounds up further away. And just the way the focus pattern is of the microphone, you have to point the mic at a certain spot and it only pick up that area so it doesn't pick up all the other ambience. This is essentially a big old ear. And the focal point is right here. So it's catching everything and focusing it in on the mic. Since they're directional, we have to prep our operators to 
Not follow the ball, but anticipate where it's going to land. One element that our production team truly loves is the doink. And that's when the ball hits the upright from a kick. Toward the upright. Oh. Is oh. off the upright. No good. The sound of that, it comes from a microphone that we place on the bottom of the upright. And it just basically is picking up the resonance of that post. All wired. And I run it straight off of the uh, post. And I actually connect it to one of our end zone cameras. And if you look at that room right next door, that's where my sub mixer sits. So he's the one that brings all the actual sounds in the game itself from the field. So he's mixing those parabolic microphones with camera mics. He has the enhanced audio. And then he'll do a, a mix of all the sounds of the game. He feeds me, and then I bring the whole final package together, what goes out over the air. Welcome to Thursday Night Football, presented by Bud Light Platinum. And welcome to Englewood, California, as we get ready for this matchup in the AFC West, the Kansas City Chiefs and the Los Angeles Chargers. We're trying to bring the best of both worlds. What the environment sounds like in the stadium and the excitement of the crowd, but also bringing with it what is going on in the field. And if we do it right, it's a studio environment and a cinematic experience, not unlike what we're trying to do with the cameras. Kelsey, good night, touchdown, Chiefs win it. Speaking of getting closer to the field, what exactly is a pylon? It's an 18 inch tall, four inch by four inch wide, three and a half pound tower of PVC soft core touch foam used to observe end zone boundaries. And then we added a camera. It almost seems like the pylon cam was something that just came up a few years ago. But the first time a pylon cam was done was in 2005 in the Jacksonville Super Bowl for Super Bowl 34. Back then, it was a real effort. There was one camera in the pylon. It was analog SD, and it was a pain. I'm unsure whether it even got on the air that day. I think maybe the difficulty from that integration delayed people thinking about pylons again for many years after that. In 2015 at ESPN, we developed a Wi-Fi-based pylon. It was sort of like a moonshot, this very vague image, but we saw the position that it was shooting from, and it was like, Oh God, that's really cool. Okay, we definitely have to do this now. So we took a whole season to create what was the next iteration of the pylon cam. All along the way, of course, one of the most important things was the acceptability by the league. The initial proposal that was brought to us involved the installation of a metal disc into the turf and the pylon had a matching metal disc and they would just sit on top of each other. And there were concerns about a player diving for the corner of the end zone, finger gets caught under the metal disc. Oh, oh, they ain't gonna look good on film. So we had to go through a very long process with the NFL, making sure that no player would be injured if they hit the pylon. They thought they were taking the right steps to add the most technologically advanced method for transmitting the video back to the TV truck. And it actually took them taking a step back and doing an old fashioned wired connection with soft pliable plastic coated wires that would pop and disconnect and be harmless. Yeah, I like that baby. Not only do the players need to be protected, so do the delicate micro cameras hidden inside. We had to create a 3D plastic mold inside that would literally crush. It would just squash down. At the ESPN Innovation Lab in Orlando, we brought in some NFL players who were on the developmental squads, and we literally had them crash into pylons and just, you know, bludgeon them in full pads and gear and everything else. So they're gonna be fine. We just needed to prove that the players weren't gonna be hurt and that the pylons would keep functioning. I remember the first time we used one on the air and Jameis Winston took it out in the second play and it was spectacular. Winston gets to the pylon and is in for the touchdown. He's a big guy and he's prone to those kinds of runs and he just blew right into it. Even the announcers were like, yeah, that's an extraordinary angle. It's obvious, they can get a first look, they get all the angles, great. We didn't want to put just one camera because we're looking down the sideline. We also want to look down the goal. Gronkowski has it as he across the pylon. Touchdown, New England. Gronk 
kicks the pylon and the pylon cam. We all still kind of had that breakaway system, which is why they hit the pylon, boom. It goes to black because the connection's broken. Remember, every time the pylon gets knocked down, then we have to have a person there go out, reconnect it, set it back up very quickly. Three cables, because there's three cameras in it. This cord just kind of slides out. So you'll have one facing the goal line here, one facing upfield, and this one faces the back of the end zone. Chip here, and that's what controls the iris, the color balance, all that other stuff and the cameras all stick out here. It goes all the way up to the cameras. So they are 4K HDR cameras, so high dynamic range. So that's the biggest biggest change I've seen in them is the, the camera quality. Right around here has got a quarter of an inch. So it's got a decent amount of padding. These cameras get super hot. So the fan's constantly spinning. So if it gets hit while it's spinning, the fan will kind of bend. Then we've got to take the whole core out of the pylon and change that fan. Each one of these lenses too, if it gets hit too hard, they pop, the cameras pop in like that. And then once it gets hit, we just take this little screw, give it a few, few twists, pop the camera back out. What's interesting about pylon cam, suddenly you were dealing with all the groundskeepers. As a groundskeeper, you hate doing open heart surgery. You're digging up their field. And that became something that we never really had to deal with before. So you can see we had to trench right here to get the pylon cam wire, buried it six inches into the ground. It goes from right here all the way over to the other side of the field. Some are really protective over their field and some are really like, I don't do whatever you want. I don't care, just, just don't leave a big, you know, big gash in my field. With the artificial turf, you have to vacuum out all the beads from the goal line all the way to this yellow line here. So you're going vacuum and vacuum about two inches of, of beads out of it. And then you put the cable in, go back and fill back on top of that with, with the beads, the rubber beads in it. An average NFL game has 12 camera feeds delivered by four camera equipped end zone pylons. The images that we're shooting were not just for the viewers, but for the officials also. In our very first year of the pylon rollout on Monday Night Football, there was an Odell Beckham catch in the end zone. The referee ruled him out of bounds. Incomplete. They say Mr. Magic didn't keep his feet in before his body came down. Our image showed that Odell Beckham had possession of the ball and that his right foot was in the end zone. Call overturned. Ruling on the field has changed. It is a touchdown. And at that point, we realized we had just validated the system. Now we have super slow motion pylons and we have wireless pylons that go along with the line to gain in the first and 10 line. Ruling on the field is that the runner is out of bounds with the ball half a yard short of the line to gain. It'll be fourth down. That's wow. Five. That's a massive call right there. Find the gain pylon only has one camera in it. It's all wireless, so you don't have to bury the cables or do any of that other stuff. This is one of the things you have to change. This is the battery pack for it. So it'll be good for about a half a game. So pull out like this. So it's got the same camera as the as the wired cable or wired pylons. The difference is you've got this, this is the transmitter for video. So this is what will be transmitting the video back to our receive sites over here. The company that I work with now, we came up with a better mousetrap about three years ago. And that's based on our camera technology and the fact that it's wireless. So that allows us to put it at unique places along the field and shoot this incredibly wide field of view. And then we're gonna take from that field of view whatever we want that's most important and we'll reframe it and repurpose it. Pumping, looking to get to the end zone, diving, and he's in. We're gonna take our technology, put it in a wired pylon on the goal, which will allow us 180 degree view from the sideline to the goal line to the end zone. One camera signal instead of three with pan, tilt and zoom in replay, something that has never happened before. And the NFL is going to use it this season. In the NFL, catching lightning in a bottle, particularly in the big games, is essential. And we've had some amazing pylon replays. It's come a long way since 2005. The pylon is becoming matured in terms of an essential piece of equipment for network TV. It's like a good touchdown. Yeah, it does to me too, Joe. 
Not to be outdone by the added visual variety of camera angles and looks that enabled the capture of action on the field, the evolution of augmented reality began to allow broadcasters to create things that weren't on the field and put them there. We think you're going to like this. The green zone, we're going to call it. And there it is. NBC has tried to improve upon the yellow line with the green zone. We put the down and distance on there. We're just trying to find ways to use augmented reality so it's additive and not, again, just doing technology for technology's sake. So now what we use augmented reality for, instead of putting big billboards or lower thirds in graphics, now we can put them immersively on the field. One thing that we're seeing a lot more of is these big 3D volumetric graphics where it's a big cable cam move or, or a big jib cam move or even the big opening for the Super Bowl. And you see people diving and catching balls and shattering and two quarterbacks with their stats and things as you're moving through it. It's easy to build a model, but inserting that model into the real world space and making it look plausible with the right lighting and shadowing. So it's not like, wow, that's really crazy artificial looking. It's like, no, you know what? The, Oh my God, is that really there? How the hell they set that up type thing? That's sort of the noble goal. They'll take specific cameras and they'll add equipment to those cameras. We'll call them instrumented cameras. Those cameras have the ability to shoot an overlay of the field that is kind of established as the framework of what that camera is seeing for the day. And the technology is able to process that so that whenever the camera moves, the graphic that it is projecting over what the camera is seeing is able to either be stationary, to move with the camera, allowing it to give it that feel of it actually belongs. As you see fans evolving, they're wanting more and more data associated with how they watch a game. And I think this is a way to add that data, but also add a new and interesting way to show it. When you talk about what can be done, say, with next gen stats, where you've now got tracking of the objects on the field of the players and the ball, now that opens the possibility for AI engines that are running and able to do virtual insertion, heat maps and things on the field, where you're gonna see the storytelling get, get more and more sophisticated. The best use for augmented reality is still yet to be seen. I think this season, you're starting to see some really cool uses of it with the Carolina Panthers, where they're using it for their in-house audiences to get people going with the prehistoric panther jumping around the stadium. And I think that those are the types of things that we're also looking at to say, okay, how can we use this to make the game information flow better and establish a wow factor? Following the wise edict, with great power comes great responsibility, it's important to ask, how much is too much? We have evolved from saying simple on the screen is better to we believe our audiences have more capacity for ingesting more simultaneous information and more simultaneous pictures. And I think that you see that where you're sitting at your computer, how many windows do you have open? Are you watching one thing or two at the same time? Yet you can completely go overboard. There's no question about that. You have to go back to thinking about whether you're aiding the story. And if you're actually giving producers and directors the tools they need to just say what's happening on the field and don't get too much in the weeds with other stuff or just showing off. And I think that that is a delicate and subjective balance that every network is going to have different litmus tests. When video games first started to be able to be sort of photorealistic, where you had Madden and now it didn't look like in television football, right? It looked like real football. I think that the video game companies looked quite a bit to TV to try to replicate that experience. Now, I think that we as television producers look to video games, not only in like a sports video game, but maybe a Borderlands or Halo and try to find out if there are different things that we can snatch from those ideas to incorporate into broadcasts. And I think that you start seeing that in our on-screen graphics. The on-screen graphics don't just look like the old school clock and score. Now, animated characters that are popping out and, 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 and it's starting to look like a video game. And I think that while we look at different camera angles and things that we can achieve, 
we look at video games as well to look at those camera angles that maybe we can't achieve and attempt to replicate them. What we're able to do is create these alternative ways for fans to view the game. ESPN, they launched Between the Lines, and it took in all these next-gen stats data points and created an LRAP experience. So you had the announcers contextualize with data. Well, really, we're making the fans smarter with the right context and the right statistical storytelling techniques. So it's not just about a data dump. What we're trying to do is we're trying to distill the need to know insights so that the fan can better understand the strategy of the game of football. It's not about us. It's about the viewer. It's about doing the right job for them. When we do add new technology, it's really important that we add things that have a tangible, positive impact on the presentation without taking away anything from it. And as long as we can add without subtracting, then we're going in the right direction. In 2021, the added abilities of augmented reality opened the door to all new presentations to all new audiences. The NFL wildcard game on Nickelodeon is unlike any football game you've ever seen before. We're rocking out Nickelodeon style. I will say this, Nickelodeon is very particular about the color of their slime. We had to make sure that everything was color matched properly, but what, what a fun telecast that was. Football. What was fascinating to me was, in some sense, you would think this is going to be for kids, right? Look at the slime monster! Oh. But it really wasn't. Oh my God. I don't know how many people I've talked to that just, they immediately switch broadcasts because they just want to see the game in that way. Slime cannons when they score. The idea of the first down line is actually slime moving it down the line. You got to sort of balance the novelty and how well it was received versus what people watch us every week. <laughs> There's probably a lot more people who want to see a broadcast with that kind of fun with it in terms of its presentation. How a bunga, dude. I like it, right? It was a technical challenge in many cases because you don't want to draw on top of players. You want to get foreground, background separated. We just added more high-end controllers to make sure that everything was going to be synchronized so that you could easily cut from camera to camera and make sure that the slime that's, you know, this part of his forehead on one camera, you cut to the next camera, it's in the same location. There was going to be no limitation to the ability of those producers to express their creativity. It was like, hey man, let it rip. I think what they've done is exceptional because they're appealing to a different audience. Good for the league, good for those willing to take a risk that could have fallen flat on its face. And now they've carved out a whole new audience and created new NFL fans. And I suppose for all of us in the industry, that's a really good thing. That was fire! On the other end of the spectrum, some fans are craving a more refined cinematic experience. We were using cinema cameras to go back to what Inside the NFL used to do. And the reason why Inside the NFL was relevant on a Wednesday or Thursday after Sunday games, and that was because they use Super 16 cameras to get these amazing shots. Come on! Let's crank it! And by utilizing these cinema cameras and finding technologies that can make them completely seamless using them live is a way to achieve what Inside the NFL and NFL Films does a couple days later during the live broadcast. The Megalodon, which is just kind of a silly name for a stabilized rig with a shallow depth of field camera. What we had been doing for some time is using a very small camera. It was a Sony mirrorless large format sensor camera and shooting warm-ups with it and different arrival shots and it just looked cool. So when we decided to put it actually in the game and we shot that first celebration. Shaquille Griffin, his third pick of the season. And the Seahawks celebrate. It was something that we didn't expect the audience to respond to as much as they did. And what I think they saw was that when there was a touchdown celebration or a moment, that we were able to capture it in this different way. Not because we had come up with shallow depth of field camera shooting or we'd never done cinema shoots before, but because we were able to intercut it live into game action. And that was the real innovation, was to use it seamlessly with the other 9, 10, 15, 20 cameras that we had. The Megalodon is an example of an idea that pays off, but not every idea hits that mark. When you dabble in technology and you exist at the cutting edge, there's no question that sometimes you'll be coming up with ideas that were charitably, let's say, ahead of their time. 
One such idea was the Top Font Graphic Project, an early automatic player tracking system. It relied on a group of taggers that would sit there and after every play, they would go and they would say, okay, this player's number 15 and this player's number 12, and they would have to do it. And they would do that like mad as the line was setting up so that then we could drop in certain names. And yeah, sometimes, you know, maybe you tag the wrong person. Maybe that little bubble would fly off or go on to somebody else. The technology simply wasn't there to accurately and faithfully track the players and we learned a lot and we put that idea and some of the underlying technology into other things. Another was a graphical system measuring the height of an athlete's jump. It turns out they only jump as high as they have to. You know, there's some new system, it's cool, people look at it for a while and then, you know, a few months later, nobody uses it anymore because fundamentally it wasn't reporting something that was important. And some ideas are too big to fail in two dimensions. They require a third, like ESPN 3D. I'll call it, it was a grand failure. I call it a failure because we shuttered it. People just didn't feel like they wanted to be wearing glasses and deal with the fact that you're kind of screwing with their brain. In taking risks, it's inherent. They're gonna be failures. One thing we can all agree on is the opposite of a failure, the greatest annual sporting event on the planet, the Super Bowl. And this premier event is fertile ground for innovation. Today will be a memorable experience for everyone, including all of you watching at home. So my first Super Bowl was Super Bowl 42 in Arizona. And back then, we really only programmed on Sunday. Sunday was the big day and that's what we did. Now, we're programming all week. And there are basically two Super Bowls that we need to produce. We need to produce the week-long Super Bowl and then we move to the game. What hasn't changed is the need to have an ungodly amount of cameras you always see the incredible numbers that come out in terms of cameras just shooting the football field. In some cases, it almost seems embarrassing that you would need 120 cameras to shoot a freaking football game. But you need to be covered in case of any happening on the field or in some cases outside the field. The producer and director of the game, we don't want to take them out of their element and what's made them successful for an entire season or an entire career. We don't want to offer them all those cameras. So we start dividing things up and organizing them. You can shoot a very good live game with 12 cameras or less. Everything else is, as they might say, gravy. Make sure that you get the replay. And we have a whole other unit that is responsible for organizing those replays. Twice the cameras, twice the replay sources, probably three or four times the personnel to put this whole thing together. We have more tools, but those tools are for specific situations, and this way they don't overwhelm the broadcast. Every year, the network that is the steward of the Super Bowl gets to demonstrate what the state of the art actually is. And the producer and director and the production team gets to show how they can use it. The assignment remains the same, which is to shoot a great game, to show the pageantry, and to make sure that you don't miss any storylines that are happening on or off the field. We have uh, an internal technology group that meets pretty regularly. Everyone talks about just what's out there, what can we do? How can we bring something new? There's not gonna be a full stadium. Okay, what can we do that we couldn't normally do? The trolley cam was one of those innovations where we said, it's never been done before. Let's track players going up and down the field. It was a two-point cable system over the first row of the stands that more or less run with a player on a big play as they break free and you see how fast they are and you can have the camera move with them. It gives you a true sense of really how quickly they're moving across the field. They go to Brait with a blocker in front. Hammer and Brait down to about the 24. It's a different perspective that helps you see sort of the uniqueness of our players. This enhances the storytelling to be able to see a player like that running in real time and the camera keeping up with it. Every Super Bowl tends to be uh, a new graphics package because broadcasters want to debut their new look for their network or for the sports part of their network, you know, on something like a Super Bowl because it's a touchstone of, of moving forward.
So we have NCAM, and that allows us to do virtual graphics off a Steadicam anywhere in the stadium. What we're trying to do is use the Infinity Board here, which is spectacular, as kind of an anchor for our virtual graphics and really kind of take it over ourselves during the broadcast without taking it over inside the stadium. And every Super Bowl has some compelling opening where they're trying to show some augmented reality, these big 3D volumetric. It's like the opening of the Academy Awards. I mean, it's a big deal, the show opened for the Super Bowl. We had a meeting in early August. We watched our last Super Bowl. We watched the last Fox and CBS Super Bowl. Kind of got an idea of what everyone had done and then started thinking about creatively, hey, what can we do this year? How do we take advantage of this spectacular stadium? And I uh, went to work on that. There's so much pressure because there's so many eyeballs on the game itself. And, you know, when you're in charge of operations and engineering like I was, I'm hard pressed to enjoy the game. People say, hey, it's just another football game. They're lying. It's not just another football game. It is the Super Bowl. You try to think of every contingency. Contingency you don't think of is half the stadium going dark and power just being lost. Half the power in New Orleans Stadium, the Superdome here, is out. You don't throw your hands up in the air and, and just say, oh, well, we're done. You, you like, OK, how do we get this show back up? Especially with some of the special technologies that are computer driven. It's when you lose power, they go down. They don't come back right away. You lose all the configuration on the cameras. So my guys are running through the stadium with flashlights. Elevators aren't working. And they're running up, you know, got in so many flights of stairs to get the camera getting things configured. And we were back up and running by the time the lights came back on for the next play. And finally, we are ready to play football again. Stuff is going to happen. Equipment will break. People will make mistakes. But we're going to be judged on how quickly and how well we recover. The next time you decide to plug in your phone charger, give us a warning, will you? I was doing some of my best work during that blackout. <laughs> yeah. so. Back then, we used these super slow motion cameras called Exmos. They weren't particularly made for broadcast, but they looked really good. They were faster than anything that was currently available on the regular broadcast market. One of them was on the reverse 50, and we had some terrible, terrible times that damn nearly killed the thing. Just really wasn't working well. Well, it had a good day, and it was working, and it ended up that was the camera, the iconic camera that caught the Tyree catch on his helmet. I just remember thinking that any loose wire or anything that could have happened to that camera, and we just wouldn't have had that shot. That's one thing that worked out well in the end. On that same Super Bowl, though, we had a telestrator that was dutifully tucked in by one of the people in the booth, and as such, overheated and damn nearly caught fire. It's not working. See if Ben's got the fan. So for that whole Super Bowl, uh, unfortunately, Troy just had to use what he termed a Fisher-Price telestrator. It looked terrible, but at least the other telestrator was tucked in all nice and warm. Every Super Bowl we go to is the most watched event, and we are dead smack in the middle of it. We make those microphones sound really good in the middle of that. That's all the pressure you need. That's pressure, pressure. What else could you want? What else could you want? But my philosophy at the Super Bowl is pretty simple. Make sure you cover the big plays as well as they can be covered, and then everything else takes care of itself. Turbo set! Pass. Caught. Touchdown. Yes! Yes! So what does the future hold for NFL fans? Where does the technology go from here? What will be the next amazing broadcast innovation? The things that we're doing are camera technologies, camera miniaturization. I think the next frontiers might be something like a ref cam. Our NFL officials are the best of the best at the highest level. That The technology has to evolve where it's transparent and seamless for them. That might be a way to get a totally unique view of the field. Will we be able to look live with no delay from the quarterback perspective on a regular basis, hear what running backs are saying. Are we going to be able to automatically click into anything that takes place on the field, whether it's a wide receiver and a defensive back or a guard and a tackle going up against each other on a moment's notice? I think those kinds of technologies are going to be there. For the future of NFL Enhanced Audio, it goes a lot like this, more more, more. Some that we're working on privately that I'll never admit here, ever. 
and some that are sort of just pipe dreams and ideas. For instance, wouldn't it be great to hear all the referees? What if there was a channel where you could just hear the referees live all the time? After he tackled the quarterback, he's giving them business down there. That's a 15-yard penalty. What if there was a coach's channel where you could just hear all the coach stuff? This is to win the Super Bowl. Let's go. Why stop at just one or two people mic'd up on the line? If the transmitters turn out to be this small in the future, why can't they just be embedded in the shoulder pads for the entire offensive line? High resolution capture and tracking. To be able to do some revisionist camera work without the expense of resolution in terms of zooming in on an area of interest. It's only maybe 20% of the original frame that was shot, like that small, through technologies like tracking and using artificial intelligence you'll be able to pay attention to a matchup all game long you don't have to dedicate to a camera to that anymore you'll be able to have one high resolution camera and have the AI behind it that creates that extraction. The remarkable attributes of C360 is that we're able to capture an incredibly wide field of view. What that means is that we're able to shoot a 360 degree circle and capture everything that is in that view, where a normal camera shooting 16 by nine would just miss it. The Gen 3 camera is shooting at 65 megapixels. So that's about 11K, which allows us to zoom into wherever we want to go, individual players or individual things that are in that frame of importance and still achieve a very robust 4K signal. It either goes to the broadcasters or it'll go to the league. And at some point it's going to go to the end user at home where you'll be able to take your phone and get onto our camera and you're going to be able to pan, tilt and zoom on your phone. I'll also mention that we're gonna be able to use data to drive it. When you think of gaming for a moment, let your mind wander and think about if you could isolate on any player in the red zone and have that as a viewing experience, as a one-to-one -one digital experience, because you know, you might've had a few bucks on him on a prop bet. For a long time, we've talked about the second screen. And I would argue that the second screen has been a bit of an illusion. What we found is that people have devices, they're just not watching the same thing that they're watching on TV. That said, I think that by having some skin in the game, whether it's fantasy football, free to play games or gambling, people who kind of want to play along in some way. Interactivity and gamification are going to become kind of one and the same instead of where we used to think the second screen was, which was just diving into more stats. That is going to end up being the interactive avenue that people and companies like ours are going to try to pursue. Gambling and fantasy sports have become a big thing. You have a running back on one team, a quarterback on another. Let's say you have five or six players on your fantasy team. Wouldn't it be nice if you could watch all five or six live as they're happening on a split screen that you have just yourself? That kind of technology will really be available probably in the next couple of years. Data will now produce a lot of interesting stats that we haven't even thought of as it relates to measuring players and measuring teams. All that data can be pulled up synchronous to one another. We have AI engines that are running that are interpreting that raw data and coming out with inferences for, for new data and new statistics. When the play happens and the data is captured, the system knows who's the receiver, who's the quarterback, who was close to them, who was the defensive back, etc. The AI engine can already build the replay graphics and give the TV production a menu of things they just hit with a single button, rather than an operator having to go, who is the passer, who is the receiver, how do I want to document this, was it third down, what's the context of this? The AI engine will already present to you, hey man, here's a great way to document this play. So that I think is, is to me where things are gonna go and document the play both with virtual, you know, on air zones and things like that. So as a viewer at home, I just saw a play, what's the implication of that? Wow, I didn't realize that was the third time that this guy's beat this guy for more than five yards in the last two quarters. Or, you know, it's, it's, these are, you know, things that are gonna make it more and more interesting for the viewer at home. Say you're interested in knowing the play before it happens. Say you want to watch the game from a X's and O's perspective. Madden the video game allows the user to tease and understand the routes of receivers on a play. 
we can do the same type of thing with next gen stats. And with a little bit of a delay, using next gen stats tracking data, we can overlay player routes and understand the play before it even happens. One of the things that I'm excited about that is currently being developed is something called volumetric capture. And volumetric capture utilizes a huge array of cameras that seek to recreate a 3D world. Again, I'll go to the video game model. Once you get the game in a 3D world now, you can put cameras, graphics, all kinds of different 3D elements inside because you, you control it. You've seen glimpses of it. In the Houston Super Bowl that we did years ago, we did an innovation called Be The Player. Utilizing the volumetric camera array, we were able to synthesize a first person view from any player on the field. Now, it wasn't moving. It was one frame and you could kind of look left and look right, but that was it. But it gave the viewer for that Super Bowl a view potentially they hadn't seen. When you can take a 3D model and register it onto the real world, what you've done now is you've allowed the ability to measure live distances and dimensions on things. I mean, if you just look at video, you can say, oh, that looks like he's seven yards. If I've superimposed a 3D model onto that world, I can tell you it's 7.23 yards. I mean, I can give you exact details of things. That opens up all sorts of possibilities for analytics, visual analytics, and storytelling. You could imagine wearing a headset and watching an NFL game live on the field. That would be powered by player tracking technology, understanding the X, Y location of every player, the speed, where they're facing. Well, if you take that spatial data and replicate it into a virtual reality machine, you could be the quarterback on the field. You could watch the game from that vantage point. Not only is emerging technology driving how the game is captured, it's now also driving how the game will be seen. Enter newly exclusive Thursday night football broadcast partner, Amazon. It'll really be interesting to see what they do with Thursday night football. How can they put their own stamp on it? What is it about their production that's gonna be different than what we've seen before? They're in a digital distribution model. This is a very clear thing that we wanna explore and what the future is gonna be. And I don't, I don't even know yet what those opportunities will be. Because you're distributing digitally, what might you be able to do? What different kinds of feeds, whether it's video feeds, audio feeds, ESPN does the multicast. That's a big production pulling it off. Would Amazon be able to do that on a week to week basis and do one thing this week, do something new the following week. And can't wait for this, a special stream from Dude Perfect. Well, we're gonna watch Thursday Night Football with you. I think the, the opportunity and the possibilities are really exciting. Looking to the end zone for the win. He caught it, ball game. All these innovations and all of the incredible people behind making them a reality have contributed to and expanded the greatest sport on television. And at the end of the day, they always keep in focus two things, the fan and the game, and the viewer always wins. Oh my gosh, I can't believe what we just saw. The NFL, because of the size and the scope, who they are, the importance of their events, really drive a lot of technology. Everyone wants to be able to introduce new technologies in this sport and with this league. And one of the key aspects of my job is to really advance the production and the viewer experience. Whether it's 100 million people watching the Super Bowl or 20 million people watching the Fox or CBS doubleheader on a Sunday or 10 million people in the one o'clock window, make that viewing experience as good and as compelling as possible. We always stress the importance of documenting the game properly. In the end, we wanted to have people have this emotional reaction based upon the game as entertainment. Because in the end, when they have that emotional reaction, what do they want as human beings? They want to come back to that ride again and again. Oh my, that may be one of the great... Does he oh, stop it? it? Oh, please! <laughs> what a catch! That's insane! All of the technologies that have been discussed really do make the game come to life. Being able to create these technologies that do that is very fulfilling. We continually want to strive to be better, but I'm not going to be afraid to fail. You can see by 
everything that we've talked about from Skycam to high definition to the first downline, all of these elements have enhanced the game and we almost take them for granted. Got it! Touchdown! And that's good. And there'll be more to come. There will be more to come. This is why we love this game, I gotta tell you, man.